Okay, Peter, um, this is fun to turn the tables on you if you'll ask me some questions, but we kind of do this in our daily life quite a bit. Uh, I mean, most people know the level of success you've achieved. I mean, 52 Academy Award nominations, uh, one of the youngest guys to run a studio, running Sony, Polygram, um, you know, your television shows, you know, well, how many years, 25 years now, 30 years at UCLA as a professor? Um, I mean, did you really need another day job? What, what the heck would inspire you to take on the intensity of writing this book at this time, you know, tell to win. Why, why did you really want to take story and get people to understand its impact in business and in life? If I knew what I knew now, I'd never do it. I mean, I was in a, a you talk about a rising tide. Yeah. This book business is like this, all right? Yeah. It's like, oh my God, can I get there before the, all the water leaves the ocean? Yeah. It's pretty, pretty daunting. Yeah. But what really happened is I was a storyteller in movies and television, as you said, in sports. I was a storyteller. That was my craft. And then I realized I had success and I had failure. And I wondered, why did I succeed more than I failed? And why did I have more joy, less pain? And I realized one of the secrets that I had, one of the talents that I had is when I told a purposeful story, when I was telling the story correctly, it was a powerful tool to engage others for success and for my success as well as their success. And so it's a story really a story that emotionalizes the information. Rather than doing data, facts, and information, which I did all my life, here are the facts, here's the data, all the, fire all those bullet points, it worked. It didn't really work because I was aiming at their wallet or their feet or their head. This is where hits are born, right here. So right. when I used story and metabolized all those things, they remembered it. Emotion bonded with information becomes memorable, resonant, and actionable. When I saw that, I realized it was no secret. Everybody had it. And so my job was not to give something to you or you or you or you, but to shine the light on something they had and say, these are the tools that you can use to extract that and use it for your success. And so that's why I did it. Well, uh, I'm glad you did, because <laughs> uh, I've had a couple of decades of you and I swapping stories, and I've gotten to see the inside of what drives you. And you've always been such an unbelievable giver to people. And I know the real reason you did this was not just because you had the information, but because it's part of your legacy to touch people's lives. So that's why you do the things you do at UCLA. That's why you take care of people the way you do that nobody knows about you, Peter, but I do. And a few of your friends certainly do. A lot of your friends certainly do. Um, I'm just curious. We know that uh, if you ask somebody, where were you last um, six months ago on Tuesday night, they have a clue. But if you say, where were you on 9-11, boom, right? Because it's not just information. There's the emotion. You know, where'd you stay? What was the hotel room you were staying in six months ago? You don't know. But if something special happened that night, you might remember, Or if right? you had food poisoning. Yeah, or if you had food poisoning. That's true. Pain or pleasure. Right. I agree with you. The emotion's there. But not all stories are equal. Not all stories are equally appreciated. Not all stories hit this heart or in the gut, right? What makes the difference? Give me three things that make a difference between a story that just gets told and a story that actually touches that heart or soul, moves someone to action, creates a real change. Well, there are a lot of elements, and any one can be a game changer. You don't have to use them all. If you use them all, maybe you'll have magic. But there are a number of elements. One thing is you don't go tell a purposeful story unless you have a goal. What's your goal? They are transporting all the information. What is the goal? And when you hide the goal, you say, I won't show them the goal. You were talking about this before. I'll, you know, I'll keep it, uh, my agenda private. They get that. You're authentic. They don't trust you. They don't trust you. Yeah. And trust comes as the formation of a relationship which comes before trans transaction, before you can get them to move their feet or their wallet. If you come in and think of these people as customers, clients, and patrons, they protect their groin, and they protect their wallet. But if you think of them as an audience and you render an experience to them, they open up their heart. And or as a friend or as family. Uh, for anyway, you're emotionalizing your offering. Right. So that's really important. Another thing that's really, really important is when Let you... Let me ask you something about that. Sure. So I can clarify. Oh. So you say, I got to know my purpose. What if their purpose is they want to get to their groin or they want to get to their wallet? Well, it's not wrong to have... Because some people have that it's, outcome. It's not wrong to have a desire to have the person transact with you. Your question is, what's the tool of purpose? If you are going to use a story telling a purposeful story to move them to transact with you, you have to have an emotional story. Got you have to have something that gets them emotionally because they're not going to metabolize it. They're not going to act on it. And if they don't trust you, they're not going to really hear you or as you use your expression, get you. Right. And when someone doesn't trust you, listen, you walk into the room hiding your agenda, you walk into the room unauthentic, before the first words are spoken, before the first word is spoken, that person gets, oh, what's going on here? That's the way we're wired. So you're saying a story, for a story to work, it's not the story, it's the relationship first. If that relationship's not one of trust, the story is just going to be seen as a form of manipulation. 
100%. So the idea is that authenticity that you, as a teller, must shine through. So what do you do? People say, I'm going to motivate. They call you a motivator or somebody else. Here's what I look at it. The first person you motivate is yourself. What's your intention? If your intention isn't authentic, if your intention isn't valid, if your intention isn't valuable, if your intention isn't generous, they're going to get that. Before Language is a technology. Before there was language, we got that. We didn't know enemy, friend, tribe, not tribe. Non-verbally. Non-verbally. And it's so powerful. So the idea is align your intention before you go into the room to prevent or present or design your attention. So you're saying that before I'm even worrying about the story, what I got to worry about is how am I going to serve them and me? Obviously, I got to serve myself also here if I'm going to be in business. That's not wrong. Right, that's not wrong. But I got to make sure that I can really see the victory for them first. Then once I have that intent, I'm going to have a different relationship from which to have a story have an impact. So perfect. And that's why you're such a great storyteller. What's in it for them has got to be what it is. If you try to be interesting instead of be interested, what's in it for them in this story? If there isn't in it, they will never take it in. They will never metabolize it. They will never own it, and they won't even remember it, let alone act on it. So that's really the, some of the core elements. But the key is it's telling a purposeful story. There are four or five elements in the tell before you even get to the story that make the story powered. You could tell, me, tell me what those are. You've got to have your own intention correct. Okay, right? that. You've got to be authentic. All right, what you is. You've got to be interested rather than trying to be interesting. Got it. You've got to have a goal that's generous. There's got to be really generosity mm. in the goal. Love that. All right? You've got to be interactive when you engage. It's not a monologue, it's a dialogue. You've got to leave room for them to own it. You can't make them own it. They've got to move forward to own it. Your job is to give them proprietorship over the story so it's theirs. And when that happens, they become an advocate and an apostle for their story and your product. Big difference, too, I think, and tell me if I'm wrong, a story you're retelling can be powerful, but a story you've experienced comes alive, right? Because you don't have to, you're not processing something intellectually. It's in your nervous system, especially if it's one that got emotion in you. Am I right about that, or how would you describe it? The primary source of a great story is your story, your experience, because then you're sharing an experience in the form of that narrative. Right. You're sharing something emotional to you. It has a value proposition, and somebody says, it feels credible. It has a sense of authenticity. You don't have to prove it. They can you know, smell it. They can smell it. And you know something? We all have a good BS meter. We know when someone's coming into the room and their feet, their tongue, their heart, and their wallet are all congruent and they're moving in the same direction. And when they're not, we're already wired to know, hey, what's going on here? We're looking for the monkey. We're looking for them to bring that thing out. Somewhere along there's a trick in this thing. When you don't have that, they open up their heart. Hmm. When you open somebody's heart, you create the opportunity for transformation. I mean, that's my life experience. How important is this backstory understanding? Knowing the story that might be filtering the way they perceive you or your offering or this moment. How important is the backstory and how do you find the backstory on someone so you don't walk in and, you know, stick your foot deeply in your mouth or some other particular orifice? <laughs> well, you get two backstories. You got yours and you got theirs. You well, better know point. your own good point. because it can hijack you in lying in your weeds. Give oh. me an example of one of those. Well, you know, I was a young boy, and when, when I was uh, uh, 12, 11, 10, I had a, an experience with an authority. I was being thrown out of school, and I ran in to tell the, 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 uh, my parents that this headmaster was telling a bunch of baloney. That wasn't what happened. And I walked in, and he was filled with badges, and all the headmaster had on was a scout's uniform with a tremendous amount of authority. And I choked up, all my sphincters closed up, and I ran out and let his story be mine. And I was thrown out of school. Meaning you just accepted, you didn't tell people that it was not true. And then what happened is, I guess I forgot it, but it stayed in me. I always had an element of authority, made me very anxious. So those red lights in the back of my window of a car, yeah. and I was driving along. And oh scared. my God, it was, it was terrible. 35 years later, I walked into the king of Thailand's palace and uh, preparing a story about piracy. And there was a whole group of people there. I didn't know who was who. And I saw the king. Oh, my God. He has all these white badges, all these uniforms on. And I shrunk back. I, well, I was freaked out. I said, oh, my God. That backstory reared its, up its head. Wow. Yeah. Instead, I pushed through it. I really did. Yeah. I, I said, yeah, we're really smart. I pushed through it. I said, I'm not going to be sucked in this time. I'm going to do it. So I went there, and I told him the whole story about a beautiful musician who lost his whole life and all of his earnings because his, his properties, intellectual properties, had been stolen. And I had done my wisdom on his backstory. I didn't know at that time that it was a backstory. He was a musician. And I said to him, you know, you're a musician. This should feel the same way to you. So that he'd want to so do he, something and about it. And empathetic. He said, yeah, yeah. And as I was telling the story, 
Uh, Ogasan came over to me and tried to grab my arm and pulled me away. He was the head of Sony, right? Ogasan. Yeah, yeah. He was the head of Sony. He's the owner. And, uh, and uh, he pulled me and said, K -k -k -k. I said, no, I'm almost finished. I'm almost finished. He gets it. He said, the king gets it. He said, Gubasan. That's not the king. That's the guard. That's the king over there. <laughs> so I told the perfect story to the guard. You know, I was so convulsed at getting through my backstory that I lost it. So it can really sabotage you if you're not careful. You know? Okay, well, tell me an example of how you find someone else's backstory, assuming you get to the right person you're going to influence. How do you get someone else's backstory so you, you're able to meet their needs and you don't get bit by some bug that's in their past? It's not easy. You, you have the opportunity, if you know them, to talk to people. Preparation is key. Yeah. You can find the footprints and the breadcrumbs and the finger marks around, but it's not easy. Uh, if you have a relationship with them, you may have a better opportunity. If you know people about them, yet a better opportunity. Wikipedia or some of those internet pieces gives you more availability information. But really what the trick is, you got to be aware for those clues when you get in the room, too. You can't, you can't just get it as preparation. It happens there. Look around the room. Look at the pictures on the wall. What is he friendly with? What, what, is he, what is he aspiring to? Look at all those elements. They tell you a lot about how they hold things. And then you've got to get a little lucky. You've got to have a good sniffer. But when you see it, like this definition of obscenity, recognize it. Don't pretend it's not there. When you see that person cringe up when you say something, recognizing you're hitting some kind of a nerve. Remember, you're in a dialogue. It's not a monologue. If you keep firing those bullet points, you're going to be in trouble. So when I see that tightness, I feel it, I see it, and I'm more direct. I'll ask about it. I'll say, listen, obviously that had an impact on you. You're probably more elegant than I am. When you see that tension that shows up, it tells you there's something else going on besides our conversation right now, or there's a reaction to this conversation that isn't moving in the direction you want to go, the deal, the opportunity, the situation, their heart's not opening, they're closing. How do you uncover in those moments what the story is? How do you do it? Well, I do it by trying to listen, listen actively, try to draw them out, try to make sure I'm not going down a rabbit hole that doesn't get a rabbit, but got a polar bear down there. You know, because once they bite you, they don't want to do any business with you. So you got to be careful. Yeah. And there's another trick to do. Know when to move on. Know when it's not the right day to tell your story. Mm -hmm. Know when to get out of it and find another way to enter the thing. Don't just fire those bullet points, fire that information, or tell your story if the environment isn't right. That's happened to me many times where I've gone into the meeting, had that kind of foreplay, had that discussion, and recognized the person was vacant, wasn't there, wasn't present. Yeah. What was it doing? Checking off my list of finishing the meeting, telling my story? No. I withdrew. I found another time to do it. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you have to get a little lucky. But the point is, the awareness is the key. Yeah. Just to be able to be perceptive, to be looking for it, to be thinking about it, to be perceptive enough to know when you see it. Right. That's the best you can hope for, because most people are guarding their story. That's their, that pain is protected. It's true. It's absolutely true. I, also, sometimes it's just the state they're in. I had this big uh, meeting plan, I think you know, years ago with uh, Gorbachev, and I'm going to fly him on this plane, and I got the goal that I want to pick his brain. I want to know what ended the Cold War. I want to know the moment of what ended the Cold War. I'm just obsessed, because this is the guy that participated in one of the biggest changes in our lifetime. Sure. Right? And he had agreed to this interview and so forth, and he got up, and the guy said, nope, he's not talking to anyone. He's not talking to you. He's just getting on the plane. He had this massive headache. And I was, I was frustrated. I'd paid charter to, you know, a Gulfstream jet. I'd worked all these details. I'd flown all there. I'm doing all this for him. And, and all of a sudden, the answer is just no. And, uh, but what I, I tried to do in that case was to figure out how it changes state. And I didn't have much access to him. You're going through an interpreter. And so I started speaking to his wife. And I just thought, there's a backstory to every man's life, which is when his wife says something he disagrees with, it gets his attention. So I deliberately engaged her, and he started correcting her, which got him in a state, in a dialogue. And then I eventually got to hear the answer to that question. So sometimes maybe it's also knowing how to change somebody's state in a playful way. Now, I know you've done that, and that's why I'm setting this up, is we've, you've shared so many stories with me over the years. And there's stories where the pitch that you gave, the presentation you gave, did not work. And you just wouldn't give up. I and mean, sometimes it's not just the ability to tell the story. It's the ability to find a way to tell that story in another way. But would you share the story, the example of what you did with Gorillas in the Mist? Well, it, that's a very long story. But the, the long and the short of it was that um, I realized I was in a room where the person had virtually made their mind up not to make the movie. Right. And, and I had to find a way to change their state, and I didn't think of it that. I didn't use that word. I didn't know that. I just did it intuitively. And that's the magic of this. So much of it's intuitive. It's yes. the way we're wired. Yes. And then we close it down and say, oh, that's child stuff. We shouldn't do that. When that's exactly what's called for. Yes. And what happened was the chairman of Warner Brothers um, 
had decided he wasn't going to make gorillas in the mist after going all the way down the, the road. And I knew if I left that room, if I left that room, even though he was thinking about it, if I left that room, the no became absolute. So I literally decided I'm going to stay in the room. And I took on the role of the gorilla. I laid on the floor, put my arms out, and I said, you're going to let this gorilla die. I talked about the gorilla. You physically I laid, physically on the laid down on the floor. And I just what said, did he say? He, he said, are you crazy? That's what he said. I said, I'm not, I'm not leaving until you say yes. I said, this is a powerful story that needs to be told. And we've gone all the way down the ro road, and we can make this thing. We will not have the risks you said. I've shown you that, and I'm determined to live with that. And I'll put my money on the line to prove it. Is it, is it true that he said, just invited the next guy into the yeah, meeting? Yeah. Then he said, OK, I've got to have another meeting. He called, he called the secretary. And you're still said, on the floor? Still on the floor. Brought him, into the, <laughs> brought him into the room. He sat down. The guy didn't notice me at first. And, and then he started making his presentation to him. And then he looked over and saw me laying on the floor. He said, who's that? And then Terry said, that's a felled gorilla. <laughs> and he said, a felled gorilla. So then Terry told the story, retold the story that I had told him. And in telling it the story, that story, he kind of owned it. You know, it was a different change. And I said to him, you got to do it, you got to do it. He said, OK, you're going to put your fee up? I said, yeah. I said, OK, we'll do it, get out. And I ran out the door. And as I ran out the door, I heard the guy say, if I lay on the floor, will you make my movie too? <laughs> so you never know. You've know, you got you to be spontaneous. And that movie, was, was it not nominated for yes, the Academy Awards? five Award? Academy Awards. Five Academy yeah, Awards. And the gorillas are still here, and I am too. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you, my okay. friend.